Okay, I think it's just 10 o'clock. We'll get started. Hello, and thank you to everyone around the world for joining us for this week's lab meeting. My name is Kristen Abood. I am the science editor at the Human Vaccines Project, and I will be your moderator today. Globally, the number of new COVID cases is continuing to decline as more and more individuals are gaining access to vaccines. However, this progress is not shared equally. As optimism grows in the US and Europe, cases are still surging in many countries in South America and Asia, fueled by gaps in vaccine access. While the EU began issuing digital COVID certificates for travel among its member nations, Argentina, Malaysia, and South Africa are among the countries that have recently reimposed lockdowns to control viral spread. According to the New York Times vaccine tracker, 60 vaccine doses have been administered for every 100 people in North America, compared to only 21 doses per 100 people in Asia, and just two doses for every 100 people in South Africa. Experts argue a rapid increase in vaccination rates is the only way to fend off viral variants, which the WHO suggests now be referred to using Greek letters to avoid confusion and geographical stigma created by the current alphanumeric system. Amidst all this, reports of the first human infected with a rare strain of bird flu, known as H10N3, serve as yet another reminder of the many pandemic threats that remain even as the world makes substantial progress against COVID-19. Before we get started with today's presentation, I wanted to note that the application portal is still open for the Michelson Prizes, Next Generation Grants. Presented by the Human Vaccines Project and the Michelson Medical Research Foundation, the Michelson Prizes are given to support promising young researchers who are applying disruptive concepts and innovative methodologies to advance human immunology, vaccine discovery, and immunotherapy research for major global diseases. We're posting the link to the Michelson Prizes in the chat, so please visit the site for more information or to apply. Just one more note before we begin. The information presented today includes some pre-published data that is currently under peer review. We ask that you not reproduce or disseminate the data presented. This session will be recorded and made available on our website and our social media channels for you to review. And with that, I am very happy to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Douglas Nixon. Dr. Nixon trained as a pathologist and clinical virologist at the University of Oxford, where he received both his master's degree and PhD in immunology. During his time at Oxford, he made substantial contributions to understanding the newly emerged human immunodeficiency virus, HIV. He then spent two years at a biotechnology company in New York working on HIV vaccine development before joining the Aaron Diamond's AIDS Research Center at Rockefeller University, first as a postdoctoral fellow and subsequently as an assistant professor to investigate how antiviral T cells function in pediatric HIV infection. In recognition of several important contributions to HIV AIDS research, he was awarded the Elizabeth Glazer Scientist Award in 2000. That same year, he joined the Gladstone Institute of Virology and Immunology in San Francisco as an associate professor. Following appointments at the University of California, San Francisco and the George Washington University, he returned to New York where he is currently a professor of immunology in medicine at the Weill Cornell Medical College. As a scientist and educator, he has actively pursued immunovirology research for more than 28 years. Among his accomplishments, Nixon gained recognition for publishing the first identification of an HIV-specific cytotoxic T-cell epitope. He is the past chair of the NIH's AIDS Vaccine Research Subcommittee and is currently the principal investigator of the NIH's Martin Delaney Collaboratory for HIV Cure Grant. During the presentation, please send me your questions using the Q&A function in Zoom. I will ask our speaker a broad selection of your questions after the presentation, and we will have about 25 minutes for discussion. 
It is my pleasure to now introduce Dr. Doug Nixon. Thank you very much, Kristen, for that uh, introduction and for um, saying those nice things uh, about me. So let me uh, do the slideshow and that should hopefully be on the screen. So I really appreciate the invitation to talk to this group. I think, as Kristen said in the introduction, COVID-19 is turning into a disease of inequity around the world. And that's actually something that I really want to help focus discussion in on today in relation to whether other vaccines that are not COVID specific might have a role in acting as buffers until more COVID vaccines are distributed to countries which have limited access at the moment. So the talk is called COVID-19, Can All Vaccines Have New Tricks? And the virologists uh, listening will notice that we have influenza uh, virus up in blue and coronavirus SARS-CoV-2 in, uh, in, in the bottom right. And the top uh, uh, right is an illustrated gram from the New York Times on COVID-19. I'd like to um, disclose that I have nothing to disclose in relation to this uh, presentation. I will be talking about potential off-label use for licensed vaccines. And I'd like to start by thanking uh, three of the key people who've been working with me on this project. Uh, Daniela Marin Hernandez, a postdoctoral fellow, uh, Nathaniel Hoopert, who is an epidemiologist, mathematical modeler, and pandemic preparedness uh, uh, person at Cornell, and Robert Schwartz, who is a, a virological colleague um, who works uh, on the floor above. I'd also like to thank uh, my old mentor from Oxford, John Kurtz, who's been um, in touch and, and very helpful in terms of discussions, Fabio Leal in Brazil, uh, Le Chambon Nervolo, uh, now a colleague at Wild Cornell, and Ben uh, Tenover from Mount Sinai, all of whom I've had um, great discussions about this topic. And we have just published, uh, came out yesterday, a mini review in molecular medicine called Heterologous Vaccine Interventions, Boosting Immunity Against Future Pandemics. And that is going to cover quite a lot of what I'll be talking about today. So for those of you who are interested in following up and reading a bit more after the seminar, please do um, access, it's open access for everyone, that uh, article, and it should cover some of the things that uh, I talk about. So as Kristin said, um, there's a lot of excitement about vaccines. And I was pretty impressed as I put this slide together this morning to see that over 2 billion vaccine doses have been now given worldwide, according to the Johns Hopkins uh, COVID map. But of course, that's in the face of uh, now over 170 million cases, known cases. Um, with uh, more than three and a half million deaths uh, around the world. But in places uh, where vaccination campaigns have been active and reaching people, there has been progress. And I think that um, what I'm interested in is helping uh, all of you on the call to accelerate the process by which uh, vaccines are distributed. And then from a scientific perspective, of course, uh, keeping an eye on the uh, variants, we're up to variant Delta, um, had to brush up on my Greek uh, alphabet, uh, uh, Epsilon, let's hope we can avoid that. So we all know that SARS-CoV-2 is the newest of the human coronaviruses um, that have uh, crossed species barrier. And uh, we look back to SARS, the original SARS, MERS, um, on the back of 
four seasonal human coronavirus in, uh, infections, which actually cause up to about a third of community acquired respiratory tract infections. And uh, these coronaviruses in the subfamily orthocoronavirinae, they're envelope viruses with a positive sense single stranded RNA. They're large, they're one of the largest of the RNA viruses, and they have this characteristic club shaped spike, which creates this image of the solar uh, corona for which they're named. I'm not going to delve into the current uh, 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 re-evaluation of the origin of the SARS-CoV-2. Um, I think it likely originated in, in animals. We think it um, could be bat, could be pangolin. Um, when and where and how the virus first entered humans is something of current topical interest. As a novel beta coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2 shares around 80% genome sequence identity with SARS and about 50% uh, with MERS. And a large part of the clinical problems has been the inflammatory reaction that um, can occur uh, during uh, COVID infection. So SARS-CoV-2 infects through the nasal oral route, um, and infect cells expressing the ACE2 receptor in the lung, as well as in other organs. Uh, and the viruses dampen antiviral interferon responses, um, evading innate immune cells as a consequence of the unrestrained initial viral replication. Infiltration of monocytes and macrophages, neutrophils, other uh, immune cells leads to a increased pro-inflammatory cytokine milieu. And this inflammatory response or in inflammatory storm uh, can lead to um, significant serious and, and sometimes fatal um, immunopathologies. You have adaptive T cells coming into the site and also an important antibody component to um, help in deactivating uh, viruses. From a vaccine perspective, I think uh, when people look back uh, with a bit more time, the operation warp speed and the development of the rapid uh, platform for COVID vaccines will be a whole chapter in um, textbooks. This was a partnership from the Department of Health and Human Services and Department of Defense with an aim to deliver tens of millions of doses of vaccine that would be um, first uh, given emergency authorization and then approved for use in the US population. And the aim had been to have 300 million doses at the end of 2020 and deployed by mid 2021. We know that the timeline from that was um, slightly uh, changed, but now more than 60% of the eligible adult uh, population of the United States have been vaccinated and if you look at a country like Israel, um, it's even greater. And um, as uh, we know, there's been some success stories in relation to countries which have really implemented vaccine um, actively. But also um, in inequity in getting vaccines to many countries. In terms of uh, vaccinations, we know that there are uh, a number of different platforms that are in existence, including the uh, highly successful mRNA. Uh, Pfizer has applied for uh, to the FDA to give formal uh, authorization to come off emergency use authorization. And um, there were not only the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines, but others um, soon waiting in the wings at various stages. There are also um, DNA platforms uh, which present spike uh, and then the more familiar recombinant protein uh, type vaccines are again um, coming through the pike. Um, viral vectors have also gone into people. Um, the best known of this is the uh, University of Oxford AstraZeneca um, uh, chimp adeno vectored uh, product. Uh, and then there's a large number of uh, inactivated um, platforms which are either in people or being tested. So the activity in the vaccine field was intense and is intense. And I think that um, many people have been vaccinated, um, getting vaccines to um, communities, reaching into areas where there's vaccine hesitancy, 
all these things are really important to help get more people vaccinated. And the president has got an aim by July the 4th to have 70% of uh, Americans uh, vaccinated um, against this new pandemic. So what Daniela, um, Nathaniel and myself have been interested in studying is what can you do, particularly in countries where COVID vaccines are not widely available, to help bridge a period to buy time until people can get their COVID specific vaccine. And of course, non-pharmaceutical interventions or NPIs, such as mask wearing, physical distancing, self-isolation, home working uh, and shielding of vulnerable populations have all been implemented in a variety of degrees. But the question that we wanted to ask as immunologists and virologists was, was there any possibility that you could use or intervene with non SARS-CoV-2 vaccines to provide some degree of cross protective uh, immunity. And this took us back into literature, which is really quite old, to a phenomenon that is known as viral interference. And this has been described um, uh, for a long period of time. It's a phenomenon initially described in which infection with one virus limits or delays the infection with a second virus. And this interference could be intrinsic, where both viruses reciprocally inhibit their infection, or it could be dependent upon the family. So it could be homologous interference, uh, same family, heterotypic, same species, or heterologous, uh, a different family. And a number of studies have probed mechanisms by which this viral interference uh, works. And this could either be host mediated, for example, an antiviral resistant state through um, interferon driven by one virus preventing the second from coming in. Or it could be virus such as defective interfering viral particles, small interfering RNAs, or competition for cellular factors. There are a number of epidemiological studies which extend this concept of viral interference and speak to a possibility that viral interference may have real life implications in epidemic conditions. So um, studies have shown, for example, that when there was early circulation of a flu um, H1N1 in Japan, um, the epidemics of winter viruses um, from RSV in the Netherlands and Hong Kong were different. And then um, a second study uh, showed that when the onset of the uh, flu epidemic was delayed um, to the beginning of autumn one year in France, um, it was traced to potential viral interference with, with a rhinovirus infection. So what we asked um, was, could these infection interferences be replicated by vaccination? And um, again, from an epidemiological perspective, there have been a number of studies for what we call the heterologous effects of vaccines. So um, Department of Defense personnel tested, were tested for respiratory viruses, and those that had received an influenza vaccine had a decreased risk of having other respiratory pathogens compared to those that were unvaccinated. Uh, and there were also interference trends noted for coronavirus and human metanumavirus. Of course, epidemiological studies have to be taken into the context of um, trying to remove bias and trying to remove confounders, both of which are very difficult to prove uh, causality in these circumstances. However, there are additional interesting uh, epidemiological evidences to support, support that virus uh, vaccines or vaccines in general might have protective roles. So live poliovirus might have a potential protective role against otitis media. Uh, and then perhaps the most uh, well-known of vaccines that are known to have bystand effects is the bacille kamet guerin vaccine um, used in some countries still for um, prevention of tuberculosis, but also in measles virus or polio viruses, which uh, lead to decrease in overall childhood mortality that can't be protect, attributed to protection against the target disease uh, alone. And uh, BCG has been shown to reduce neonatal mortality 
uh, by 38% in high infectious pressure environments. Uh, and also CHA was sustained over, over many, many years, beneficial effects in older children and adults. But um, again, very complicated to assign uh, causality. However, this led us to develop the concept of what we're calling HVI or heterologous vaccine intervention. So heterologous immunity is the induction of an immune response to an unrelated pathogen or antigen upon exposure to a different pathogen or antigen. The heterologous and non-specific effects of vaccines suggest that they can affect the immune response to organisms other than the pathogen's specific intended purpose. So HVI is the acronym that we're using to describe the implementation of vaccination campaigns of available non-specific vaccines to induce a heterologous immunity during an epidemic or pandemic. Uh, and last week uh, in PNAS, uh, Konstantin Chumikov and colleagues uh, with Bob Gallo um, wrote a very nice uh, perspective review uh, on this field as well. And um, their argument here is that specific vaccines against a new pathogen require extensive preclinical and clinical development, scaling up of uh, production. Um, we know um, with urgency and expediency, some of the stages can be combined. Um, but uh, on the other hand, having existing uh, vaccines, um, which would need only phase three clinical studies for efficacy can be stockpiled in advance, or the manufacturer could be ramped up in parallel with testing. And so they could be deployed, deployed sooner and used for a bridge vaccination. So this uh, review, um, in addition to our review in molecular medicine, I think are uh, good summaries for those who are interested um, to follow up more in this topic. So how might uh, this cross reactive or cross protective or innate protective activity occur? Well, this could be at the level of um, uh, cross reactivity from uh, previous uh, human coronavirus infections, um, in other words, mediated by pathogens, same family. Um, but there also can be, um, as I've just talked about, uh, potential effects from other vaccines um, that are not related to SARS-CoV-2 or to coronaviruses. And the BCG vaccine is the um, leading, um, I would say, heterologous immune agent because of its um, defined mechanism, which is through a phenomenon called trained immunity. And trained immunity is a de facto um, immune memory of the innate immune system, which enables a stronger immune response to a secondary stimulus. So um, the number of ways this trained immunity has been shown to work uh, with BCG, you can get release of pro-inflammatory cytokines by uh, PBMCs after intradermal BCG vaccination upon re-stimulation with a different pathogen. BCG vaccination also induces a rewiring of transcriptional programs of uh, hemopoietic stem cells in the bone marrow and leads them towards myeloparesis. So there are quite a few studies which have described mechanisms by which BCG vaccine has um, bystander effects on the innate immune response. So of course, we, like everyone else, would be asking, could there be any potential clinical relevance of um, using BCG as a heterologous vaccine intervention agent um, in relation to respiratory infections. And uh, last year, we were excited when an interim study was published in Cell on the results of the ACTIVATE trial. And the ACTIVATE trial is a randomized clinical trial of BCG vaccination against infection in the elderly. And it's a double-blind randomized trial with around 200 elderly patients who received BCG or placebo at hospital discharge and then were followed for 12 months to see whether they had any new infections. And at interim analysis, uh, vaccination with BCG significantly increased the time to a first infection. And the instance of new infections was decreased significantly after BCG vaccination compared to placebo vaccination. And most of the protection was against respiratory tract infections, a probable 
uh, viral origin. But at this time, there's no data from this study of potential protection against SARS-CoV-2 infection. And there are a number of other clinical trials that are ongoing to specifically test the impact of BCG uh, in the context of SARS-CoV-2. So if we think this effect might be real, what could the possible biological mechanisms be? Well, I've talked about trained uh, immunity, but the number of other immunological ways that this type of heterologous effect might be mediated, regulation, uh, modulation of memory cells, innate amine boosting, potential cross-reactive uh, immunity, either through antibodies or T cells, um, cytokine responses, uh, etc. Uh, and when you look uh, through the literature, uh, for each of the vaccines listed here, there are well-described potential ways in which uh, vaccines might be able to uh, impact uh, innate immunity for a short or medium um, term, including um, from the oral polio uh, vaccine, viral interference, long-lasting interferon uh, responses, um, live attenuated influenza vaccine, through TLR3 and TLR7 mediated immunity, even from the inactivated influenza vaccine through boosting of uh, interferon gamma from natural killer cells, um, vaccinia with cross-reactive T cells. But also, I think we also have to remember that some of the adjuvants in which vaccines are uh, given might themselves act as pattern recognition receptors and potentially uh, uh, increase uh, and induce innate um, uh, immunity in a way that we haven't studied so well. So um, what are potential epidemiological evidences for relationships between vaccine effects and SARS-CoV-2 SARS infection rates? So, um, here is an exploratory study in which uh, a group from the Mayo Clinic analyzed immunization records from more than 137,000 individuals who had received SARS-CoV-2 PCR tests. And they found decreased SARS-CoV-2 rates in individuals who'd had recent non-COVID vaccinations of a number of different types, even after adjusting for geographic SARS-CoV-2 instance and testing rates, demographic comorbidities, and number of other vaccinations. Um, so uh, this was um, one of the first pieces of evidence to suggest that general vaccination in population health may have an impact on SARS-CoV-2 uh, infection rates. Another study um, published last year in, in vaccines was aimed to evaluate whether influenza or pneumococcal vaccinations were associated with a positive SARS-CoV-2 uh, test, and this is data from the Italian cross-sectional web-based survey um, called EpiCOVID-19, um, based on um, a survey of self-selected uh, adults. Uh, and they looked at um, uh, uh, just under 200,000 individuals uh, who filled out the questionnaire, and then they looked for uh, the probability of a positive SARS-CoV-2 um, swab um, in relation to influenza or pneumococcal vaccination. And they found um, that those who'd received anti-pneumococcal or influenza vaccinations were associated with a decreased probability of a positive test. Um, and so again, from an epidemiological uh, perspective, from the perspective of vaccines protecting against SARS-CoV-2 infection, um, there's some evidence that this might occur. Well, what about protection against COVID disease? So um, a number of epidemiological studies have shown that um, BCG vaccination is associated with a lower number of COVID-19 cases and reduced mortality. And this is the paper from Escobar and colleagues published in PNAS uh, last year based on their epidemiological analysis from Germany. And um, again, I want to keep on stressing that all of these studies are complicated and complex due to inherent biases and multiple, multiple confounders. And all of the authors and all of these studies have attempted to somewhat mitigate that. But I think we have to um, remember that it's hard to remove all biases and confounders from these type of uh, analyses. 
So um, Escobar performed a filtered analysis of COVID-19 mortality per million inhabitants in countries with current uh, or never or interrupted BCG vaccination programs. And there are still a number of countries in, in Europe, um, uh, Latvia, Lithuania, Hungary, Bulgaria, Poland, Greece, Estonia, and Ukraine, which currently still give uh, BCG. And then there are a number of countries that they use as comparators that were never uh, who've never given BCG or, or gave BCG uh, somewhat in the past. Uh, and they found a negative correlation between the BCG index and COVID-19 mortality per million inhabitants uh, during the first month of the pandemic in socially similar European countries with different BCG vaccination rates. So uh, we looked at the relationship between past influence vaccination and case fatality rates in Italy and found a negative relationship between geriatric influenza vaccination. So that for every 10% increase in influenza vaccination coverage, there was a 3% decrease in case fatality ratio. And another study has shown a similar uh, result uh, with multivariable uh, analysis, their conclusion. Um, from the uh, Amato study was um, that the rate of influence vaccination in uh, um, people over 65 was associated with a, a less severe clinical expression of COVID-19. Uh, another study from Brazil looked at COVID-19 mortality outcomes of people vaccinated against influenza at various time points. <clears throat> Again, um, they did multivariable logistic regression and tried to uh, work with uh, confounders. Uh, but they also found um, this same uh, association. So you probably note that I'm already talking about confounders. Um, it's really an important thing to consider, systematic error uh, that can occur in epidemiological studies, well known. You just have to um, make sure you talk about it. And um, there are a lot of different reasons why these um, studies might have confounders which were not taken into a case. But that brings me back to the ACTIVATE trial, which actually is a real trial, double-blind placebo control trial, which has not yet reported on um, impact on SARS-CoV-2 infection or COVID disease, uh, but does show a, a real significant decrease in um, viral-related respiratory infections um, that's uh, in people who receive BCG vaccination. So um, why might influenza vaccination work? Well, 13 years ago, I didn't know that this study that we published um, might come back to uh, be potentially useful. And we showed that natural killer cells are boosted for a three month period after killed influenza vaccination. Uh, and a study from uh, Natea's group um, has also suggested with killed influenza vaccine that there might be an impact on, on trained immunity. So there may be a biological uh, mechanism uh, as well. So uh, what about incorporating um, heterologous vaccine interventions and non-pharmaceutical interventions together? So uh, Nathaniel Hubert is one of the uh, main participants of the um, COMO model. Um, it's COVID-19. 19 International Model Modeling Consortium, COMO, based out of the University of Oxford, uh, with Wild Cornell as a major partner. And COMO is a web-based uh, program which allows the estimation of population-level impacts of immune boosting through heterologous vaccine intervention. COMO model and this mathematical model is used for many different uh, um, COVID-related issues, but we used it to assess the potential impact of interventions um, of heterologous vaccine. Um, interventions. So we started with Germany, uh, and you'll remember in the earlier studies I talked about Germany, and the question we wanted to get from studying Germany was could we use the coma model to estimate an efficacy of heterologous vaccine uh, intervention? So Germany is a unique opportunity to compare the potential effect of the age of BCG vaccination on susceptibility to COVID-19 is um, prior to unification, the prior East and West Germany had different vaccination schemes. And in West Germany, those that were 22 to 59 years old today were vaccinated, while in East Germany, um, 45 to 84 year olds received at least one dose. So um, the mortality rates of COVID between East and West Germany were quite different. Uh, and this was also replicated uh, from a different study um, uh, by Hauer. So with that information, 
we could use this um, population data to determine um, what a, um, a potential heterologous vaccine intervention efficacy might look like. So we simulated publicized um, non-pharmaceutical interventions implemented across Germany and introduced BCT vaccination as an intervention in the model. And assuming a relatively high acceptance rate to NPIs, we found that a heterologous vaccine HVI efficacy that fitted the available case mortality data from the former East German states was around 5%. And then we simulated what the combination of um, uh, efficacy is BCG vaccinated, uh, instituted prior to the onset of SARS-CoV-2, along with NPIs would have produced in the former uh, West Germany. And assuming, um, so without BCG, um, we could calculate the median population infection rate in former West Germany of around 5% uh, through the end of June 2020. Um, but with BCG uh, vaccination, that went down to uh, 3.1%. So um, our model has been able to um, um, come in with some uh, um, guesstimates of heterologous vaccine interventions, and we've published that for those who are more uh, would like to go into more details. So um, we then modeled um, different scenarios of HVI for controlling COVID with six different scenarios um, and calibrated the model to reported um, COVID related um, hospitalizations and mortality in the United States through October 2020. And um, we calibrated the model and the model fitted well with the existing data. And then we used the model to project what the impact of heterologous vaccine intervention might happen in the um, USA if there had been a three week campaign with um, uh, different levels of effectiveness and in different population age groups. So vaccine, vaccinating 18 year olds and over using highly effective heterologous vaccine intervention with an efficacy of 15%, um, the model predicts would have led to a 15% reduction in COVID mortality. Whereas if we had just vaccinated the elderly population, the mortality reduction is reduced uh, and is around a 8% reduction. If we go from mortality to hospitalization um, or, or cases, then um, at the maximum of efficacy in the model of 15%, um, the model projected that um, hospitalization and caseload would be reduced by uh, um, a whopping 48% um, compared to if um, no heterologous vaccine had been introduced. So in this model, uh, we've shown a potential additive effect of vaccine interventions to reduce hospitalizations and mortalities. And we think given the safety or profiles, um, BCG and or other vaccinations could be targeted to individuals to help in reducing caseload, healthcare utilization mortality. Uh, and those combination vaccine strategies to get up to a 15% efficacy, for example, might involve a number of different combinations. And because of the urgency of the current pandemic and the time it's going to take to roll out um, COVID vaccines to vulnerable populations and countries, we believe, and for discussion, that the benefits of these interventions likely outweigh their risks. Um, and just in the last couple of minutes, um, this has led us to thinking about how we can help prepare for, for future potential pandemics. Uh, and we think that immunologists are important to be brought into the pandemic preparedness conversation. We feel that immunologists in general have not been part of the conversation and we have a, a, a scientific life perspective in trends in immunology, which goes through some of our thinking about um, how immunologists can help in terms of coordination, we've already seen this from a number of different sites, through different societies, through different participations in research efforts. Uh, and uh, we propose that immunologists are part of a pandemic um, preparedness task force, that um, immunologists need to be from day one part of the group that come in to help 
Um, and we also um, posit that we need to create a, a, an immunosurveillance in a large and frequent universal population sampling, and even the creation of world or national immunology specimen banks where we could sense the immunological pulse or immunological terrain of a population uh, and really be able to follow at population immunology level how um, different infectious agents may be uh, impacting populations and then using mathematical models to um, help facilitate a number of different studies. Um, so I'm going to end and just point out again over the last day our reviews just appeared online with open access uh, and most importantly to thank the people who um, have been involved with this work and I'd like to thank you for listening and I'd be very happy to uh, take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Nixon, for that very clear and provocative presentation. Um, so we have quite a few questions coming in, so I will jump right in. Uh, we have one question on whether vectored and mRNA vaccines could result in the spike protein finding its way into more off-target or non-immune cells as compared to traditional protein antigen vaccines. I think that's an interesting question. Um, to my knowledge, there's been limited studies of um, target cells post vaccination. I think those studies are being done and results will be um, available soon. Um, we know, um, I think that even with the mRNA vaccines that um, I think the traditional thought for initiation of a vaccine-related immune response through um, uptake with uh, local cells in the vaccine site region, um, carriage to uh, draining lymph nodes, uh, antigen-presenting cells, that's all what we expect. So I think that um, we'll know more about a real answer to that question in hopefully soon. Right. Okay, so we have a, a question about that this, this similar approach was proposed during the early 80s during HIV and the desire to use the polio vaccine for treatment or prevention of HIV and um, whether that ever produced any relevant info that could be applied here. So um, polio, um, I, I think polio vaccine is like BCG, um, the uh, all polio vaccines create a very interesting uh, vaccine that's had um, well-described epidemiological effects. In relation to um, HIV infection, my understanding is that it did not have any impact, but of course, you know, we don't have an HIV vaccine that works at the moment. We now have COVID vaccines that work and HIV being a, a retrovirus with its re reverse transcriptase and integration is a um, something which I think is potentially even harder to get rid of, um, as we know. So uh, to my knowledge, there has not been a positive benefit from the polio vaccine in relation to HIV acquisition. It's um, obviously a potentially interesting um, epidemiological association if one could go back to um, early cohorts, the Max and the Ys cohorts, and look at people's viral load before antiretroviral drugs came in. I don't know if anyone has gone back and looked epidemiologically at those who had received oral polio vaccine. Probably most people had, so it might be hard to have a control group, but uh, I'm not actually aware whether anyone has gone back and looked at that retrospective analysis. Right, right. We all know how difficult it is to induce immunity to HIV. <laughs> um, we have a question that the most widely pop, the most widely BCG vaccinated population may be or is likely India. And it's also really the most hardest hit by COVID-19. So how do you explain that given your observations? Sure, and I, I think um, when you're talking about biology, one is talking about um, a range of uh, phenomenon. And I think that um, what we are thinking and what we are seeing is potential 
uh, you know, it, it, it may be that a viral load is reduced, but then someone who is infected, their genetics or other environmental uh, factors will kick in and relate to a, a different disease course. In India, I think like everywhere, it's a complicated component over people who will become sick and then people will get hospitalized and then who will die depending on resources. So um, I think that the prevention of acquisition and the amelioration of a disease course uh, is going to be variable. I think uh, if there was anything that was so dramatic that you know you, you got the BCG vaccination and you didn't get SARS-CoV-2 infection, we would have known about that. So I think it's a gradation. Um, but I also want to re-emphasize the value of clinical, of a properly conducted clinical trials to address this question. There are a number of clinical trials that are ongoing for the results of which we are awaiting. Um, and that's why I come back to the ACTIVATE trial as um, the one that has shown a reduction in viral respiratory infections. Um, but uh, yes, I think uh, we also don't know the length of time between a vaccination and an effect. So that while there are long-term impacts from BCG vaccine, um, it may be that we don't know this, that people who got BCG vaccine in the last six months in India may not have um, had as worse a COVID experience. So there are lots of interesting things to follow up on. Right, I think, and we have a very related question to that, which is that do the innate responses peak within the first days and weeks after vaccination? And have you modeled whether the beneficial effects wane over time from the heterologous vaccination? Yeah, so um, we're continuing to do a number of, of modeling. At the moment, we're looking for effects that might last between three weeks and three months. Um, so in our own uh, influenza vaccine study where we looked at natural killer cell responses, they had waned by about three months. So there may be a short term uh, effect from innate immune boosting. Mm -hmm. um, and that's probably the most likely scenario. But I think then if you are um, thinking about introducing policy about how to potentially uh, boost innate immunity in your population as a whole. Okay. It's um, an interesting consideration. Would you try and have a number of different vaccination campaigns um, that were going on with different vaccines? So everyone in a population might um, be getting some type of innate immune boosting. It, it's sort of almost, although we're not allowed now to talk about herd immunity, um, if we talked about herd innate immunity, um, mm. and this gets to, you know, what is the immunological pulse of a population? And I think if you um, read the work of someone like Skip Virgin, who um, has explained how um, when we live with our viromes, that um, we're constantly exposed, and he talks about an immunophenotype of a person that gets translated into a population level so that... Um, the, the innate immune response of the sum of, of your local population may be quite important in determining overall population health. Right, right. So to that end, would you think that taking the BCG as a booster either before or after the COVID vaccine would boost immunity? So um, I think that um, it, it, it might, and, and we've also published a, um, a letter on that, which I didn't talk about. It's in uh, eClean Medicine, one of the Lancet um, uh, journals. And, and I have a letter out in New England Journal of Medicine today uh, talking about um, using a vector boost for an mRNA prime mm -hmm. as a way of stimulating T cell responses. I think you know, this comes to a general uh, conversation. I read today that Bahrain is now recommending an mRNA Pfizer vaccine as a boost for those that have received two doses of the Sinopharm uh, vaccine because the two-dose Sinopharm 
uh, in some people is not providing sufficient um, coverage and um, so the boosters coming in. So uh, we know that the uh, Oxford uh, mix and match um, uh, Con uh, Cov or whatever it's called. I keep on thinking of comics there, but it's it's, it's an important um, six arm study. The NIH has their own mix and match study. I think um, I would not um, suggest if you had availability for a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, that would be the preference. That would be my recommendation. But if you didn't have vaccines at all, yeah. is there anything that you can do if you're if you're Vietnam about to experience um, a rapid increase in infections and um, minimal COVAX vaccine, is there anything one could do to help the population? Um, this is, you know, not known, but it's worth talking about. Right, right, absolutely different considerations. Um, we have a question on whether you think the live attenuated vaccines might be more efficient at eliciting vaccine cross protection through trained innate immunity. I do. I think that um, uh, live vaccines in, um, are more likely to um, stimulate better innate immunity. I think it was a bit of a surprise to us to think that inactivated vaccines might also uh, do that, but then that also led us to think about potential adjuvant related effects that those vaccines are in. So I think there will be a gradation um, and you know, BCG, polio, um, top of the list. Right. Um, but if you are going for your annual inactivated flu vaccine and um, you know, I would encourage people to continue to receive their routine vaccinations, um, what we are proposing for discussion is whether in the face of a pandemic, people should be encouraged to have their routine vaccinations updated. Um, it's obviously a, a topic for discussion. Yeah, absolutely. So we have a question on Thailand, which has a, a very high infection rate and a, a low fatality rate. And the question of whether you think lifetime exposure to enteroviruses could offer tolerance to infection and reduce the severe outcomes from COVID-19. So I think that's a really interesting question. The, the, the epidemiological evidence suggests that um, we are uh, impacted very much by infections and past infections and current infections. Uh, it's complicated to tease out. We know for example, in people with nematode infections, that they develop skewed T cell responses and have different vaccination responses. We know that there are a number of different phenomena, um, and that can be environmental, it can be infectious, it could also be genetic. We have a paper coming out tomorrow um, that shows um, from a genetic perspective that people who have um, the lowest inflammatory levels um, are those that have the worst COVID outcomes. And we think that this may be because um, um, within the population, people have variable um, levels of immune activation, activity, um, and this may be what's happening in, in, in Thailand, and that could be genetic or it could be environmental, but your, your preceding immune status if you become infected with SARS-CoV-2 could have a dramatic impact on what your inflammatory response would do. And what we're postulating in the paper it's coming out, I believe tomorrow, um, is that uh, people who have a lower response have this sort of exuberant catch up if inflammatory um, storm. And, and that's partly related to, to the problem. But I think, uh, you know, obviously that's, you know, in terms of Thailand, no infection is good, but the fact that um, the COVID um, morbidity is lower is great. Right, right, absolutely. We have a question about whether you've ever observed the contrary effect that is a vaccine that has a negative impact on subsequent heterologous infections. Yeah, the, um, the, 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 with the DPT vaccine, there has been a negative effect reported in girls. But we're going through that um, data in a bit more detail. Um, we haven't completely finalized our analysis and, and, and we may um, think that um, on reanalysis that may not 
turn out to be such a significant problem. But it does remind us that any intervention at all uh, always comes with a potential risk. And um, so it becomes a important risk benefit uh, consideration to, to think about what, if, if we started giving everyone BCG vaccination, there were going to be risks. Right. Um, but if there is a potential beneficial effect from dying from COVID, um, there's also a real potential benefit. Right. And then we had a question on whether the barrage and use, use of uh, vaccines in young children could be providing some of the protection against severe disease with COVID-19 that we're seeing. Um, yes, I think uh, we are in the process of trying to model that, but um, when I talk about population immunology, which is sort of a, a field that hasn't really um, arrived, it's arriving, I think, um, what we know about population immunology in kids is even less. So um, I think one of the fascinating things about this infection is this huge spectrum of clinical disease and the asymptomatic component, particularly in, in, in younger uh, kids that we've seen and adults, young adults. Um, but what that does to their immune system as it's developing is, is really, I think, still um, a mystery. And, and, and how that might impact um, the whole population, I think this is a really interesting question. We'd like to get to the answer of that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you so very much, Dr. Nixon, for this excellent presentation. We really appreciate you taking the time to share this interesting work with our audience and for answering the questions. Thank I'd you very much indeed. Thank you. I'd also like to thank the attendees for participating in today's webinar and for submitting such great questions for our speaker. We are really fortunate to have such an engaged audience for these lab meetings. And with that, I'd like to invite you to join us two weeks from today on June 17th for the next Global COVID Lab Meeting. Our speakers that day will be Dr. Daniela Weisskopf and Dr. Alessandro Setti from the La Jolla Institute for Immunology. Their presentation will focus on the definition of the molecular targets of T cell recognition in SARS-CoV-2 and variants of concern following natural infection and vaccination. And if you're interested in more research on COVID-19, please sign up for the HVP COVID Report, a bi-weekly newsletter that provides insights from experts around the globe and highlights the latest scientific articles and data. And finally, please visit our website and follow us on LinkedIn, where we will upload a recording of today's webinar. And with that, I'll say thank you again for participating today. Stay safe, everyone. And we hope to see you again on the next Global COVID Lab meeting. Thank you so much.